first policies. He helped revitalize American Steel, Coal, Telecom, and textile companies. For more than half a century now, there is virtually no part of the American economy in which he has not created jobs. Born in Weehawken, New Jersey, Ross earned his undergraduate degree from Yale and later an MBA from Harvard. Not long after that, he was making a name for himself on Wall Street, heading up the bankruptcy unit at Rothschild Investments, a post he held successfully for 25 years. It was during this time that Ross first met Donald Trump. Ross was representing the bondholders threatening to foreclose on Taj Mahal Casino in Atlantic City. You really get to see what they're made of. And he was made of much stronger stuff than a lot of the uh, owners and operators of uh, troubled businesses. In the late 1990s, Ross struck out on his own, opening W.L. Ross & Company, where he continued to turn around distressed companies. One of his biggest successes, International Steel Group. Not only was the venture profitable, but the way Ross operated won praise from the Steelworkers Union. Well, look at the relationship we had with him was one where he was open and uh, accessible and candid and honest, and uh, he put a lot of money back into the mills. And so that literally tens of thousands of jobs were saved. Now at Commerce, Ross is spearheading President Trump's jobs effort, making sure American businesses keep their edge and their employees. And key to growing jobs is making our trade deals fair and balanced with China, NAFTA, and even our longtime European allies. The confidence in our country is back like it hasn't been in many, many years. All right, there you have it. Um, pretty good, right? It's great. Is it accurate? Um, well, the Trump part is certainly accurate. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I also neglected to introduce um, Wilbur's wife, Hillary Geary. She's a great friend also. While we're on that subject, I want to introduce the true celebrity in the Cudlow family, my distinguished artist painter, Judy Pond Cudlow. <laughs> All right, Wilbur, thank you for doing this. We really appreciate it very, very much. Um, you're the Commerce Secretary, so let's talk business right at the top. Is business improving? The stock market says it is, or it's going to. It's had a 25% increase since the election. Um, how do you see the current business situation? Well, I think the animal juices are starting to flow. And I think a lot of that has to do with the regulatory reform. Every day, CEOs are coming into our office, usually looking for something new. But they usually begin by saying, how happy they are and how much better they're doing because of the reduced regulatory burden. In fact, one of them gave me this little pin to wear, big red oval with a pair of shears on it. And I think it's a fitting symbol. It was actually the government of Kentucky who gave it to me. Fitting symbol for what he's doing and a fitting symbol for what we're trying to do. I mean, I think it's interesting. Um, a lot of people say that Trump administration is failing because they haven't gotten major legislation through. But actually, the regulatory story is almost a hidden story. In fact, the president took big steps today to uh, deregulate Obamacare and, right. and provide new choice and presumably lower premiums, um, which is terrific. I think I wanna, when you talk to these guys, large and small businessmen, do you feel a sense of confidence? Do you think they're ready to make commitments, either start a business, expand a business, make a five or 10 year commitment for capital spending, which we really haven't had in, in almost 15 years, and which has damaged real wages. Is the confidence coming back? Oh, I think it is. I think it's coming back big time. A number of them have announced plans to expand even before the tax cut comes, comes onto the horizon. And I think, assuming we get the tax cut, that will really be very, very powerful for the economy, because it'll have a multiplier effect on everything else we're doing. And the people will start pulling the trigger. Oh, yeah. Right now, they're on the sidelines. Well, already, we have Foxconn doing a bring in from overseas, huge facility, 10 billion. A couple weeks ago, on my trip to Thailand, we got back the $6 billion petrochemical plant for Ohio. These are big numbers and in important places. We're going to get the tax cut? 
I certainly hope and think so. I can't imagine that any sane Republican in the Congress will vote against a tax cut. Really? I could introduce you to. <laughs> well, 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 Larry, you know more people than I do. Regrettably, that's the case. <laughs> um, I want to come back to the tax cut. Stephen Mnuchin, I call him the apostle of growth. We worked together in the campaign formulating right. the sure. tax cut bill with, with others. And he's been out there now for a good period of time talking about a 3% plus growth rate if these tax plans uh, are, in fact, um, put together, and how that will create and generate so much more income and revenues, uh, more people working, uh, that in effect it will be the, the pay-for. I call it the mother of all pay-fors. If you're worried about the budget deficit, uh, which I really never am, but there are people in this town that are, and you, you want to put that into the uh, framework of a scorecard, um, he feels 3% growth will give you a couple, $3 trillion, and that will cover the whole deficit issue. Um, do you agree with that? Are you out there saying similar things? Well, I think it will cover a lot of it, even if it doesn't cover all of it, but I'm pretty sure we will be deficit neutral, mm -hmm. not... But, uh, but Revenue neutral, right. And do you agree now, we finally got the president to do this. We tried to work on him last summer and fall. But now he's adopting this view publicly that the business tax cuts, large and small companies, actually the biggest beneficiaries are not the Bernie Sanders rich people and all that nonsense. The biggest beneficiaries, it turns out, with good research, are middle-income wage earners. And the president is beginning to make that link, business tax cuts, middle-income wage earners. Um, you buy it? Well, it's true. M most middle-income wage earners are employed by somebody. Most of them are not self-employed people. And if more employment comes in, if there are more capital expenditures, more growth, Clearly, it will benefit those folks. We haven't had any real investment, again, since 2000. That's that true. capital formation has slumped so much, it's probably by itself dragged GDP down a percentage point, if not. Oh, oh, I think it has. And remember, too, after we get the tax, the next program is going to be a big infrastructure program. So that, right, more jobs. More Should jobs, be. More wages. So with all that said, uh, I want to read... Um, a most regrettable, a most regrettable statement. I hope not by me. No. <laughs> Even if it were, I wouldn't say it. Uh, but um, Larry Summers, who I have known for the better part of 30 some odd years, President of Harvard, Secretary of Treasury, was Obama's top economic advisor. Mm -hmm. So, okay, he doesn't agree with our plan. It's okay. Not everybody's going to agree with our plan. But he makes a statement here, and I'd like you to comment on it. And in fact, I was in the West Wing yesterday, and you may be writing something of a rebuttal. Um, he says this. It's clear enough to demonstrate that the claims of Stephen Mnuchin, Treasury Secretary, Gary Cohn, Director of the National Economic uh, Council, and Kevin Hassett, chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, Summers says there is a combination of ignorant, disingenuous, and dishonest. Now, again, I've known Summers. He's a smart guy. You can just ask him. He'll tell you how smart he is. <laughs> but again, I'm okay with a dialogue and a debate, and I've had panels with him and so forth and so on. But ignorant, disingenuous, and dishonest, that's wrong. I mean, that's just wrong. Those are personal issues that he shouldn't raise. And if you don't write a rebuttal, I'm going to write a rebuttal because somebody, we can't, that's just not right. We can't let that thing happen. What's your take on this? Well, I don't think ad hominem attacks add much to economic theory. Right. So that's the first thing I would say. The second, yeah. and it's not necessary. If it weren't for the hurricane, f the two hurricanes, the fact is we would have been over 3% this quarter right. without 
a lot of the things that we're already doing. So the notion that we were in some sort of 1.8% prison is simply wrong. I wouldn't call him disingenuous about that. I wouldn't use the other ad hominem. I just think he's plain wrong. Um, Kevin Hassett, who's just come on to run sure. the Council of Economic Advisors, an old friend, a good friend of mine, helped develop some of these things, uh, particularly on the business tax cuts. Economics profession, God. Um, but then people started exploring and investigating. And as he said in a speech before the Brookings Institution last week, um, he cited eight or nine what we call peer-reviewed academic papers. Right which corroborated his point of view. And we saw in the paper today, Larry Lindsay steps up and right. you know, says the tax cuts will increase wages. Um, I've been saying it for a long time. I'm waiting for Summers to go after me. But maybe he will, maybe he won't. Why is it? Why can't we have a sensible discussion about this new policy? In other words, they had eight years. Right. And Summers was at the lead. They right. had eight years experimenting with huge spending programs, huge regulatory programs, huge tax increases, and it was the worst recovery, at least since World War II. Right. Okay? So my thought is a simple one. You had your chance, right? You, ha you won those elections, you had your chance, you implemented your policies, and it didn't work. So I would ask, why don't you give us a chance to implement our policies, which, you know, we can discuss them, we can refine them. If they don't work, we'll admit it. But why don't you, it's our turn. Give us our turn. That's the basic point I'm raising. Well, I think the real reason is they're petrified that it just may work. Right. And if it just does work, not good for their future. Um, my co-author, I have to get this plug in, JFK and the Reagan Revolution. It's a terrific new book out. I recommend it to everybody. <laughs> My co-author, Brian Dimitrovic, agrees with you. We were on radio um, a couple nights ago, and he called it the last stand of the Keynesians. Mm -hmm. And if they lose this one, they're out of business. And I, maybe there's some of that, too. But I think there's this, um, I don't know, political polarization. People call the president certain names, this and that, and the other thing. Why don't we just focus on what the country wants to focus on? Well, you know, strange thing to me. Uh, I grew up in a fairly liberal household. And in those days, liberal meant open to new ideas. Yeah. Nowadays, I think you have to redefine liberal as meaning totally closed to anything but their dogma. Do you agree with the president? Corporate tax rate, no higher than 20%. He really wanted 15. Yes, he draws he a red line at 20. You agree with him? Well, I think we'll get the 20%. You do. I think the 15 was getting to be a very hard thing to get to. I loved it. Well, sure. Just sure. loved it. Sure. In fact, I was meeting with the president several weeks ago. He, he said he wanted to keep it at 15. This was before he switched yeah. over. And I said, sir, you're probably the only guy in Washington, D.C. who wants a 15% corporate tax rate. You nod, and I said, except when I come down on the plane and try to help you well, out. Well, the problem is, as you know, there's this mechanic. We have to use the reconciliation. We have to use the Congressional Budget Office scoring. So there are a lot of artificial You don't have to. Well, no law. It's not a law, but it's practice. You know, um, let's just stick with this for a moment. I don't want to get too far in the grass, but this is a very important issue. In my view, process should never block good policy. Never block. But when I worked as a Reagan budget deputy, right. the original reconciliation process was two years mm -hmm. and that gradually became three years and it went to five years and in recent times it's been ten years Ten years, right? But there was never any law there was never any rule there was never any constitutional amendment uh, you can do whatever you want to do with reconciliation well but the you who can do whatever they want to is not the administration it's the Congress right that's where the flaw comes. And as far as I can tell, Congress is much more about process than about results. Can you break through that? Well, we've been trying. Reagan did. I mean, he was in a similar situation. People didn't think much of him around town. He wasn't part of the club. Uh, he wanted to clear out a swamp. 
and um, he broke through. Well, let's hope we do. Yeah, same thing. Um, no budget. Now, I, you can't have a tax cut without a budget. Right. And I think the House will get a budget resolution. I think. I'm not 100% sure, but early returns are good. However, the counting on the Senate side are not good. And I have been involved in some of this, and I'm going to speak to senators at breakfast. But they can't get 50. There's no count for 50. And without that, you can't have the tax cut instructions. No, I know. The whole thing would just die of its own weight. No, no, that would be tragic for the American economy. Are you working the hill on this? Uh... Well, uh, I have my own budget issues. <laughs> I was over there two and a half hours today uh, testifying why we need more money for the, se for the uh, 2020 census. Oh, the census. That's yeah. right. You have that in the Commerce Department. Yeah, there's everything in Commerce. <laughs> you know, you're a tough businessman. Why don't you just, can't you take a third of that department just write out? Write out what? Just write out. End it. A third. The weather, you could privatize that. The Bureau of Labor Statistics, you could privatize that. You got all those, I mean, big buildings, long corridors, <laughs> lots of staff. I know a little bit about it. Um, take a third out. All right, maybe that's not fair. You don't have to go on the record. <laughs> but perhaps you'll consider it. Um, finally, just a couple more things. We're not going to go on all night. Um, you were on CNBC, the morning show, last Friday. Yes. Okay. Right. And um, if my interpretation was correct, basically, you're saying, look, our biggest issue right now is tax cuts and tax reform. Therefore, we're going to go easier on the trade negotiations. You mentioned steel and NAFTA. I assume you meant China, too. Um, is that your strategy? No, we're, we're going slower, not easier, on steel and aluminum, the two, 232 cases we were doing. Uh, it's not easier. It's just with pacing the timing so as not to create flack prior to the tax cut. To get 50 votes. Yeah, we're trying to. Yeah, no, I get that. Um, President, much in the news today and yesterday on NAFTA, um, somewhat ambiguous, he said he would probably prefer to renegotiate, but if he can, he can't. We'll just pull out and do it individually. Um, I was around when Reagan first proposed the Canadian Treaty, the beginning of NAFTA. Um, the business community doesn't want that. Um, Tom Donahue, who runs the Chamber of Commerce, people from the business roundtable, they want to maintain NAFTA. There may be changes and amendments to it 20 years later, but they do not want to dissolve NAFTA. No, well, it, NAFTA has worked pretty well for the big multinational corporations. Where it hasn't worked so well is with Mr. and Mrs. America. They're the ones who've lost their jobs because they aren't as mobile. You can put a factory in Guadalajara just as well as you can in St. Louis. But if you're a 50-year-old person, you're not that mobile necessarily. Um, so what's the biggest sticking point for you? In NAFTA? Yes. Well, I think we've made clear we want substantial changes in the rules of origin. Rules of origin are what say what percentage of the total value has to come from within NAFTA. You might have seen, I wrote an editorial in the Washington Post a couple weeks ago showing that our content, uh, the U.S. content, in cars coming in from Mexico and Canada is around 15 percent. That's all. So this myth that, oh, well, you don't have to worry that the cars are coming in from elsewhere because it's mostly U.S. content is simply wrong. Worse yet, where our declining share of content has mostly gone is not even to Mexico and Canada. It's gone to Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. to China and to other countries. But what kind of a trade agreement is it that encourages imports from outside the trade agreement as opposed to developing ind indigenous facilities within it? It was poorly conceived. And one of the many mistakes was they put part by part which ones were subject to the 62 and a half alleged percentage. Well, 
many of those parts are no longer even used in cars, and there wasn't much electronics in cars back when NAFTA was done, mm -hmm. so there's nothing in there about electronics. Mm -hmm. So it was some academician thinking he was being very clever, saying, I'll specify the parts. Well, anybody who bets against technology is not very sensitive. Can you actually do that now? In other words, as you add up the content, whether it's the parts or the cars or whatever, can we actually figure out, because it's so, it's so integrated, it's so intertwined, is that possible these days? Well, when I was in manufacturing, I'll tell you, I knew where my parts came from. In the steel business? In any business. And you think, okay, with new technologies, and I'm going to talk about the digital revolution in a few moments, Look, it's it, still it, possible to count that way? Sure. You, have, you, you buy things, you have purchase orders, it's all computerized. You have numerical controls over your inventory. It's not that hard. I, I think it hasn't been particularly well enforced, and that's been true of a lot of things in, in trade. We, we brought 48% more trade cases so far this year than the prior administration did in the same year to date, and I've only been there since the end of February. Um, why are... The administration seems to take a position, and you're one of the leaders. Why are imports bad and exports good? Why, why is that? Why not a free market so that people will make their own choices? And you know, a, a lot of the stuff we import, we're actually importing for our corporations right. that use this stuff. And right. then it gets sent out as an export to someplace. But, do we want a, a planned economy that says exports are better? Well, we are dealing with a planned economy. It's called China. And uh, their plan is to export a lot more than they import. And I don't think anybody can doubt that the reason China has grown so fast is it achieved that very well. It's a very well-managed... I want to join with you in attacking China in just a moment. Uh, okay. One of my favorite things. Uh, but on the other question, we had this yeah. debate a little bit with the, the bat tax, which right. I opposed right. uh, strongly. Um, I mean, let it just happen. We don't. We can't. We're not like Europe or some of these places that try to plan and manage everything. We're a free market economy. Yeah, I mean, but we export is, in order to imports. Yeah, but the world is not a free market economy. That's the missing piece. Uh, again, there was an editorial I did in, I think this one was Financial Times a few weeks back, comparing the trade barriers that we have versus Europe uh, and versus China. Take automobiles. Our tariff is 2.5%. Europe is 10. China is 25. Mm. There are some countries even more than 25. That's not free trade. Mm -hmm. Those countries have done a better job claiming to be free trade than they have practicing it. If they would practice what they preach, our deficit would be a lot lower because we would have a level playing field in exports. Same thing, uh, South Korea. They impose non-trade, non-tariff barriers, mm -hmm. namely very strange standards for imports of cars, and we only get to sell 25,000 cars per US OEM, not subject to those barriers. There are all kinds of abuses like that, and that's what's wrong with the theory. The, the original free trade theory was fine. Those countries that can make a particular product better and cheaper, they should be exporters of it. Those that make it more expensive and not as good should be importers, and ones that are balanced should live off their domestic production. That's a great theory. It's a great theory. But it's not I, corresponding. I right, I don't know how you implement it, it, it. It's like a lot of things with economics. The theories are perfect. The only thing is they don't fit the real world. Yeah, I thought you were going to say the problem is that economic professors don't fit the real world. But <laughs> I would argue this, that if, you're, if the tax cuts go through, right. for example, and the economy returns to a more normal 3 to 4% growth rate, uh, which I think is likely. Um, I would argue that 
we would grow faster than the rest of the world on the margin, and we would actually have larger trade deficits because we will import more. But I would also argue that the flip side of a trade deficit, uh, Mr. Secretary, is capital inflows. And if you get your tax plans and your regular, we're going to be destination. Everyone's going to want to invest in the United right. States. Trade deficits on the one side, capital inflows on the other, I would take the capital every time. Well, those aren't the two alternatives, that number one. This is the idea that incurring current losses, which is what trade deficit is, in order to have people make investments is a little bit like selling your house because you're over overdrawing on your credit card bill and eventually American Express owns your house. I don't think that helps the guy with the cardholder. Of course, the trade deficits have to be balanced by capital inflows mm -hmm. because both sides have to add up. So that's not and any kind of rocket science. Especially, sir, by direct investments. Direct investments. Right. I mean, there's capital and there's capital. Uh, I thought, and we had some of this discussion in the campaign, but I want the money from all around the world to help us, you know, redevelop, re-energize America. And with this pro-growth tax plan, um, it just seems to me everyone will want to invest capital in here. But, but the logic, the, the, the conclusion to that means we will grow even faster. We might grow at 5 or 6 percent, yeah. and our trade deficit's going to expand. Well, well, that would be a fine idea if we were short of capital to begin with. I don't know of a single worthwhile project in recent years that hasn't been able to get financing. I doubt you can find one. Or a business that has enough confidence to make a seven to ten year commitment, which I think is really the problem. No, but my, my, your point was we need capital from uh -huh. outside. I don't think that that's the case. We, we are a provider of capital. We, we're we very capital rich. And I don't I challenge anyone, tell me a really good project that made economic sense that couldn't find capital domestically. All right. I don't think you can find one. Risk for another no, or another segment on that. I apologize. We went too far on trade, but he's a trade expert. Probably the only thing we disagree on in all the intellectual universe. And you defend it. Well, we have to disagree well, on something, or you'll never I invite me back to your show. I don't like to. <laughs> thank you. I don't, I don't really like to disagree with you, if you want to know the truth. Um, let me end this thing. Uh, we are here at Google, Google headquarters in Washington, D.C., and this is a joint Newsmax uh, uh, Google presentation uh, in the nation's capital. So just for a moment, let's talk about the information revolution and the digital revolution and how you think it impacts trade. Um, a question was sent to me, in full disclosure, by a Google executive, but I think it's a good question and, and worth going through. So the argument is the digital revolution has had a very positive impact on America and specifically on our economy. Oh, sure. Numbers are bandied about. Um, this chap um, used the number 500 uh, billion. I, I, don't, I can't verify that or not. But, but the point he wants to know, um, the impact of digital trade on trade pro protection or trade negotiations uh, or anything related to that. What's your take on that? Well, first of all, some of the other economies are trying to restrict the digital mm -hmm. economy. China is, is one, and Google will tell you, the closer you get to content, the more difficulty you run into in China and mm -hmm. in a lot of other countries. Mm -hmm. Similarly, there's a big push toward localization of data as opposed to uh, letting data be uh, all on clouds and not geographically linked. Um, those are bad things. Those are adverse. And even more adverse is what looks to me like a witch hunt that the EU was on against the big American high-tech companies uh, imposing all these tax things. I find it a little bizarre that these bureaucrats in Brussels 
uh, telling Ireland how to interpret their own tax law. Mm -hmm. That seems a bit of an overreach to me. This is like, if you go back a bunch of years, everyone was attacking Microsoft. Right. Remember that? And they were bringing lawsuits and the Justice Department, and nothing came of it. Nothing was ever proven. But you're quite right. The EU was in the leadership of this damaging. And they'll probably do the same thing with our big information digital companies, too. Oh, I sure. think some of that stuff's already starting. So just to end this generic discussion, I mean, China, we, we may have to make nice with China now because of North Korea. There's nothing wrong with that. The president seems to have a good relationship with the uh, Oh, he does. Chinese he has president. good biochemistry with President Xi. But they do bad things for us, with us. Bad things. They lie, cheat, steal. They steal our intellectual property rights. You know this. If you want to open a new company, if America wants to open a new company or a new affiliate, right. you, you have to go through the federal government. But you, you got to, you know, get vigorous to the local, provincial government, right? Well, American I, I style 18, politics. I had 18 factories in China. I understand the problem pretty well. And so they want to see all your plans. Right. Right? You got to well, lay it out the, the and all your secrets. The intellectual property, right. So can we nail them on that? Well, this uh, is where one where I'm absolutely with you. Well, as you're aware, President Trump issued an executive order uh, directing the U.S. Trade Rep to conduct a 301 study of that very topic. And hacking, last one, hacking. They're hackers. We may blame Russia. Russia may should be blamed. We may blame other things. But we know China's hacking everything. Well, I think everybody's hacking everybody, <laughs> right. as I can tell. Is there anything we can do about it? Uh, I think we have to re-quote Shakespeare, neither a hacker nor a hackee <laughs> should there be. I can't resist. You came on our show so many times with such great insights. Uh, I just have to believe if we get the business tax, if we get the whole tax cut package, more or less as it is, it will trigger a boom. It will trigger a boom. I mean, a real boom, a boom boom. And um, the stock market will reflect that. Well, I think so. Remember, if, if you change the carry down of pre-tax profit to post by 20 some odd percent, which is incrementally at the margin what this proposal would mm -hmm. do, that's pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. How many companies have 20 percent growth in a given year? So this would superimpose a one shot 20 odd percent growth on top of whatever growth they already have. Second, it would give more dividend paying capability, more capital expenditure capability. It would really do a lot of things. My biggest worry about the constraint on growth is the workforce. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very involved with Ivanka Trump in her workforce of the future, and the truth is our high schools are not properly equipping people for the jobs in the new technology world. And it's driven big corporations to where they have to pay local community colleges to do programs to teach people mm -hmm. about computers, about welding, about all kinds of things. Which is a good thing. thing. Which is great. Great thing. But it shouldn't be, with all the money we're spending on education, we're not spending it on what used to be called vocational training. Right, right. We have the least vocational training of any OECD country, the least. Mm. That's ridiculous. And there's a social opprobrium that has come if you don't go to college. Mm. Well, I think pushing kids into college when they're not right for it, right. all it ends up is tragedies because the one third of all people entering college don't have a degree even six years later. Mm -hmm. But you know what they do have? $50,000 of accumulated right. student loans. What a terrible thing to make people think that they can do something that they sh shouldn't be doing and then saddle them with debt as a penalty. It's horrible. So besides the tax cuts, who's your pick for chairman of the Federal Reserve? <laughs> <laughs> one thing I've learned... You know I can't resist my... But one thing I've learned coming to Washington is if you're smart, you stay in your own silo. <laughs> Federal Reserve is not in my silo. No. <laughs> my hope, though, is whoever gets that job does not 
believe that growth by itself causes inflation. That's the old Fed model. And they could stop out this whole boom. I'll just leave it at there. Um, let me just say many, many thanks to uh, Commerce Secretary Will Ross for his insights and his overview. I appreciate it. Um, someday we might come to, together on trade, maybe, maybe <laughs> not. And um, thank you for the audience for coming here. Thank you.